Hey team, uh, so I really want to talk to you about the really fascinating biology of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 viral infections and the immune response to that. Um, and But before I do that, I've just got to do a quick video kept giving you a catch up, uh, a little bit of a, a crash course in viruses. So let's just jump into viruses. First, quick crash course. So uh, here we have a mammalian cell. Uh, uh, and a bacteria, which is E. coli, very common cell. We use it in research. It's also all guaranteed in your intestine right now. And here we have SARS-CoV-2, the virus. Um, now, the, these are all being done with an electron microscope, which allows us to inc see incredibly tiny structures. But these are not to scale. Now, let me just quickly adjust them to set them to scale right now. This is what they look like to scale. So what we can see is the mammalian cell is obviously massive, bacteria are tiny, and viruses are incomprehensibly small. Um, they are so small and they are so simple. Uh, that's the first thing you have to understand when we start talking about viruses. Now let me give you a quick breakdown on how simple they are. Uh, what I did was I put the human genome into a Word document. So here we can see the, the genetic code, A, C, A, A. That's the genetic code of the human genome and it's in a Word document. Now I actually crashed my computers multiple times trying to get the whole genome in. So this is actually only 1 30th of the human genome. And you can see there are pages and pages and pages. There are in fact uh, 25,000 pages of human genome code, and this represents only one thirtieth of the human genome. Now let's compare this to uh, SARS-CoV-2, shall we? Uh, let's have a look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So here's the genome, again I plugged it in. Now the SARS-CoV-2 genome is an RNA genome, so it should actually be A's U's, C's, and G's in the genome, but by convention we write it down A, T's, C's, and G's as well. So here we can see it can fit on very, it is a very small genome. It is in fact only 52 pages. And if we were to break that down to hard numbers, um, in terms of letters or nucleotides, the human genome is about 3 billion, while SARS-CoV-2 is about 25 to 30 thousand so they are completely different if i was to read out the sars-cov-2 genome saying one nucleotide per second a c t g it would take me about six hours if i was to do the human genome at that same rate not sleeping not eating not going to the toilet 24 7 a day just reading out the nucleotides it would take me around about a hundred years so there is an immense difference in the complexity, the amount of information, uh, just everything that goes on into a virus. It's so simple. It's crazy. Right. Uh, so the question is, is how can something so simple exist, right? How can it replicate? How can it exist? And the answer is it's, it steals our machinery. It doesn't need to code for the proteins of metabolism, of life itself, of protein creation, of any of that, or membrane organization, because it steals our machinery to make the virus. This is, um, now viruses have a, a, a wide range of life cycles. So I'm just gonna give you the a coronavirus life cycle, but they're all somewhat similar to this. Basically, they enter the cell, they open up, their genome comes out, um, and their genome is then, they then create a protein called RNA polymerase to, to replicate their genome. So you end up with loads and loads of their genome. That genome then goes into the cell's machinery to create proteins, so the cell then makes all the viral proteins. Then this then is assembled, the genome plus the protein, plus in, in the case of the coronavirus, cell membrane as well. We can see this membrane around the coronavirus um, is all assembled. And then either often the cell dies and pops, releasing the virus, or the cell can remain alive, in this case in the coronavirus, which is a very clever thing to do. And it's 
um, they overtake the cell machinery so it is intentionally excreted by the cell in a process called exocytosis um, but this is roughly how viruses work they overtake the mammalian cells machinery to make themselves there are actually also viruses for bacteria and they and they overtake the back they get the bacteria to produce the virus so this is how something so simple can exist and replicate uh, because it doesn't need the complexity because it's not making it from scratch it's getting someone else to do the dirty work for it and it actually results in a really interesting debate are viruses alive because if we look at the viral particle outside of the cell like this guy right here it does nothing when it is outside of the cell just sitting there as an entity when it is a single entity it does nothing it doesn't create proteins it doesn't have a metabolism it doesn't breathe it doesn't even replicate it's only once it pops open and almost disassembles so now it is not an entity um, and then the parts uh, duplicated within a, within a cell, a mammalian cell or a bacterial cell, duplicated, duplicated, or a plant cell, um, a duplicated and duplicated, and then it reassembles into that entity, that particulate, it then does nothing again. Once it's, once it's an entity, it does nothing. So is this entity alive if it does nothing? Um, and that's a gray area. Most, most scientists come down on the fact that it is not alive because it doesn't do anything. Um, and to put that a little bit in perspective, there's diseases called prion diseases, which are just a single protein. And that protein then goes on to change the host cells and the host organism of that prion proteins, proteins into prion proteins. So now it is just a protein essentially replicating itself by changing other proteins into its form of the protein. Um, and those are definitely not alive. They are just a protein. Um, you know, they are, they are as alive as, you know, a factory machinery creating paper clips or something like that. They are not alive. They are just uh, little molecular machines that replicate themselves. And so this is sort of the spectrum. We, we, we don't, it's almost naive to think about life as a hard line. Um, it's, it goes from a definitely not alive through to a gray area to definitely alive. And prions are right at the bottom, definitely not alive, but they're a little bit more alive than a rock, for example. Um, uh, but then viruses are another level up and then bacteria and everything. And scientists have arbitrarily drawn that line between bacteria and viruses, but it is arbitrary. There are, there are, there are bacteria that are obligate parasites. They can't live outside of the organism, so on and so forth. So, and so, you know, it is a gray area, but roughly that line is above viruses and below bacteria. Um, so before we jump into uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, I'm going to take you through the common cold. It's a good place to start. You can, I can introduce you into a couple of viruses and we can go from there. So the common cold is actually caused by a number of viruses. And most of them are caused by these viruses called rhinoviruses. Now these rhinoviruses, their genome is an RNA genome. So humans have a DNA genome. This virus has an RNA genome and it is encapsulated in a protein capsid. Now these proteins um, are very rigid and form these very geometric structures around the genome and they protect it in the harsh environment. There are multiple species of rhinovirus and there are 100, over 160 types. And what we mean by types is our immune system would see them as something different. Um, you know, the, the definition of a species starts to break down a little bit at, at, at the viral and bacterial levels. Um, is a few genes different, a different species. Um, but so we, we, call, we start to call them different types of the same species. So there's over 160 types spread across three different species of rhinoviruses. And they are responsible to 30 to 80 percent of colds. Um, next up, we have adenoviruses. Now, it is super important. To, let's just put a pin in this because I'm going to do a future video about adenoviruses because um, biologists, research biologists, use adenoviruses all the time. And actually, we use them in genetic engineering a lot. But also, there is a COVID-19 vaccine that is made out of an adenovirus. It's a chimpanzee adenovirus, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Um, is made out of an adenovirus, so we're going to come back to that. 
But adenoviruses are a disease virus and they cause a number of diseases, um, depending on which part of the body they infect. Um, they have a DNA genome. So unlike the uh, rhinoviruses, which have an RNA genome, adenoviruses have a DNA genome, but they too are encapsulated in a protein capsid, which is a rigid geometric structure made entirely of protein. Um, there are over 88 types, and they are responsible for 5 to 10% of common colds. Then we have coronaviruses. So this is really interesting. You, dear listener, dear listener, dear viewer of this video, have, had, have probably had a coronavirus. And that's because coronaviruses, there are multiple species, and so I'm not talking about SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, as you might know it. Um, I'm talking about coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Around 15 to 10 percent, uh, 15 to 5 percent of common colds, 5 to 15 percent of common colds are caused by coronaviruses. Now, um, these are encapsulated in a membrane with proteins embedded in the membrane. So unlike the other two viruses, which were a rigid protein geometric structure, this is a floppy phospholipid bilayer membrane envelope that surrounds the coronavirus. Where did it get that membrane? Of course, it stole it from us. That's where all viruses get everything that they have. They steal it from us. But yeah, they essentially budded off um, an organelle inside the cell to create their um, uh, membrane envelope. They have an RNA genome, um, and there are many species. Five cause cold-like symptoms, um, and there are other species that infect other areas of the body. In fact, I live in Hobart, Tasmania, and currently right now there is a coronavirus going around the dog parks, and it causes diarrhea. And because dogs love to eat poo for some reason, I don't know what evolutionary function that is, um, it's spreading around the dogs. And it is a coronavirus that infects the intestinal tract. So yeah, these viruses can infect, these species of virus can infect different parts of the body. Um, but they all tend to be um, a little bit more targeted and uh, specifically focus on certain regions and certain cell types of the body. So if it's an intestinal coronavirus, it's less likely to infect a respiratory tract. There are, you know, this depends, and we're going to go into the detail about it. Um, and it's responsible for 5 to 15% of colds. Now you might uh, ask yourself, why don't rhinoviruses and adenoviruses and coronaviruses that cause the common cold, why don't they go on and infect other parts of our body? Why don't they get into our heart and, and our lungs? They actually typically stay up in the upper respiratory tract. Why, don't, why aren't they infecting our intestines? And the answer is, for a virus to get inside a cell, it needs to grab onto a protein that's expressed on the surface of that cell. Um, so... Typically, typically. Now, there's always exceptions and there's always variation, but I'm talking generally. On the surface of a cell, there'll be a protein, and that protein does something else. It's a receptor or something. It does something for that mammalian cell. The virus has evolved, learnt, uh, to grab onto that protein to force itself into the cell. Now, because the, pro the surface proteins of different cell types are different, Viruses typically learn to infect one or two different cell types or exclusively the cell types that express these proteins. So these cold-causing uh, viruses will grab onto proteins that are on the surface of cells that are present in your upper respiratory tract. And these, cell, the, these uh, proteins won't be expressed in the brain, for example. So these viruses will typically not go on to infect the brain. Now, some proteins are expressed on the surface of many, many different cells. So the virus has the ability to affect a lot of cells throughout the body. And in fact, SARS-CoV-2 is one of those. And we're going to dive deeper into that. There's another little interesting fact about colds as well. Um, your body is 37 degrees. So most viruses learn, uh, have evolved for their proteins to function optimally at 37.5 degrees. And so what our body does as a defense mechanism is it increases that body temperature, 38, 39, 40 degrees, to get outside the optimum range which those viruses operate and the viral proteins operate. It's, in a, it's a crude immune defense strategy. Um, cold viruses, they infect the upper respiratory tract. And the upper respiratory tract is 
exposed to the cold of the environment. And so it's typically not 37 degrees. And these viruses have evolved to um, operate best um, at 32 to 35 degrees, for example. Um, which is another reason why they don't go down to infect the body, because it's too warm for them. Uh, and another interesting fact, going back to, uh, this is just full of Jack's facts, I like to call them, they're a little bit off topic, uh, but this is an interesting one. Bats' body temperature um, is typically a little bit higher. Um, people have theories about um, the flying causes huge physical ex exertion, which means that their body temperatures build up heat, just like going for a big run. So their body temperatures are 38, 38.5 degrees. And a lot of these viruses that we're being infected with have jumped from bats. So SARS-CoV-2 definitely spent some time in a bat. It may have jumped to another species and then jumped to a human. We're still trying to figure that one out. But it definitely um, came from a bat reservoir. So the virus evolved in a warmer mammal, a 38.5 degree mammal. So when we raise our body temperature as an immune response to try to get outside that optimum zone of SARS-CoV-2, it's less effective because the virus itself evolved in a mammal which has a higher resting body temperature than we do. So it's a less effective tool. It takes away one of our immune weapons. Brilliant. Okay, quick, quickly, why are they called coronaviruses? Well, June Almeida, Professor June Almeida, a Scottish virologist, and David Tyrell, a British viro virologist, are essentially responsible for discovering uh, coronaviruses, and particularly, uh, June, was, Professor Almeida was particularly important in this, visualizing them, seeing them under an electron microscope. And when they looked at them under an electron microscope, they could see that it looked kind of like the virus was wearing a crown. And so that's where David Tyrell, uh, Professor Tyrell actually came up with the, um, uh, Professor Tyrell actually came up with the name for them. He suggested calling them coronavirus based on the images that Professor Almeida had taken. She essentially um, uh, developed the techniques for concentrating the viruses so we could see a pure viral sample on the electron microscope using what's called negative staining. Now, corona comes from the same uh, term, language origin, I'd guess Latin, I don't know, <laughs> language origin as crown, and interestingly the sun has a corona too, and that comes from the same origin as a crown, as these streams of plasma come off the surface of the sun. So the sun has a corona, um, Royal people apparently have a corona. They get to put this on, these silly little crowns. And um, and the viruses have a corona of... Now, what makes up those... I'll, I'll do a deeper dive into this, but what makes up this crown-like structure from the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the spike proteins. And I'm sure you've already heard of those terms in the media. Um, it's the spike proteins that coat the surface of the coronavirus that make it look like it's got a crown. But I'm going to delve a bit deeper into SARS-CoV-2 in the next video.